Good morning, and welcome to the Mount Diablo Unitarian Universalist Church. I'm the Reverend Leslie Takahashi, and my pronouns are she and her. And uh, for those of you that are surprised to see me this morning, more will be revealed unto you later. Um, we are very glad that you are spending time with our congregation here this morning. For those who are visiting us, we are especially glad to extend a welcome to you. And I feel a need, since it's uh, 50 some degrees in the middle of July, to particularly hail those out on the patio. Can we just give them a round of appreciation today? Absolutely. For those who are visiting us, um, I will just tell you that in the fall, we will have a, our next Connecting You and MDUUC, which is a chance to learn more about our congregation. But in the meantime, there are so many wonderful people who can help you answer questions. So please do stay and ask any questions you have after the service. On the first Sunday of each month, which happens to be today, we have an opportunity for people who are uh, ready to make the commitments of membership to sign our membership book, and we will be doing that today right around 11:30, um, 11:45. There is a lot going on at our con congregation. There are many ways to connect, and the best way to keep up with what we're doing is to um, pay attention to our This Week at MDUC email, which comes out every Friday. If you are not receiving that, please mention that to our greeters table on the way out, where you can also sign up for um, connecting you and MDUUC. We really want to um, take a moment and encourage you to find ways to connect over the summer. I know that many of us, I've been hearing from a lot of you whose summers, summer plans have been affected by the continued state of the world. And um, it's a great time to connect with folks. We have a, a community circle that's starting in just a couple weeks. And Michael will also be leading connect groups on some Sundays in the summer, so watch for those. A great chance to have a conversation with someone else. We are also, this summer, going to have a supply drive for those who are teaching in our public schools and who are required to spend hundreds of their own dollars on supplies that are not furnished for them. If you are a teacher, please um, see Michael or call Nancy Rivara, who is coordinating our drive. Or if you are uh, interested in donating, please watch for the list of needed supplies through the summer. Please contact uh, our summer minister, our amazing intern, Michael Macias, over this summer if you are in need of a listening ear or special care or financial support. Asking is a gift you give our community and welcome to this beloved community. Good morning. Good morning. My name's Nasa Matt. I'm a member of your board of trustees, and I use she, her pronouns. Mount Diablo Unitarian Universalist Church is a welcoming faith community. We bring our, begin our services by reading together our mission. We bring, bring to life our Unitarian Universalist values as we seek truth and work for justice, nurture compassion and courage, reach out to each other and to our larger community of faith, bridge the divisions that wound the human family, transform ourselves and our world. Welcome to our service. We are so glad to have you with us, and we hope that you are keeping safe. We'd like to take a moment to thank Peggy Kroll, Sally Edgerton, Joe Galinas, for their work on our Close the Gap auction, which raised over $20,000. We'd also like to take a moment to thank Bob Boster and Kathy Vale for their generous match. We really appreciate the community coming together. And welcome. It's good to be together. It is a holiday weekend when unusually it is raining in July and chilly, and it's wonderful to have as many of you present on campus as we do. So if you're watching us virtually, we invite you now to greet each other in the chat if you can, and if you're here, we invite you to enthusiastically and warmly exchange greetings.
Good morning. My name is Mary Beth Spencer, and my pronouns are she, her, or they, them. This quote is from Ibram Kendi and was in uh, The Atlantic two years ago on July 4th, 2019. As we all know too, as we know all too well today, wealthy white American men did not stop rebelling when they won the American Revolution, when they gained the power to protect their declared independence. They continued to rebel to keep their power. They, the patriots, the rest of us have continued our rebellions because we have yet to gain the power to be free. The resisting rest of us, the unpatriotic. On this 4th of July, the rest of us and our wealthy white male allies should be celebrating our ongoing struggles for freedom and not celebrating as if we are free. We should be celebrating our disobedience, turbulence, insolence, and discontent about inequalities and injustices in all forms. We should be celebrating our form of patriotism that they call unpatriotic, our historic struggle to extend power and freedom to every single American. This is our American project. Because power comes before freedom, not the other way around. Power creates freedom, not the other way around. We can't be free unless we have power. Freedom is not the power to make choices. Freedom is the power to create choices. And to have the power to shape policy is the power to create choices. That is why power is in the hands of the policy maker. I would like to invite our children and youth and those young at heart to come forward for our time for all ages. And I'm going to invite you to imagine that you are sitting around a campfire this morning. So I'm going to tell a story that I first heard sitting around a campfire. So if you were sitting around a campfire, what might you be doing? Marshmallows. Eating marshmallows. Yes, I should have thought of that. OK, good point. Thank you very much. We will keep working on this. But here is a story. And this was a UU campfire that I was sitting around when I heard this story. Um, and it, probably only a UU campfire would you hear this story as a campfire tale. There once was an old Zen farmer. Every day, the farmer used his horse to help work his field and keep his farm healthy. But one day, his horse ran away. And all the villagers came by and said, Oh, we're so sorry to hear this. This is such bad luck. The farmer replied, bad luck, good luck, who knows? The villagers were confused, but they decided to ignore him. A few weeks went by, and then one afternoon when the farmer was working outside, he looked outside and he saw that his horse was running back onto his land. The horse was not alone. He was returning to him with a whole herd of horses. So now, the farmer had 10 horses to work his land. All the villagers came by to congratulate the farmer, saying, wow, you have such good luck. The farmer replied, good luck, bad luck, who knows? A few weeks later, the farmer's son came over to visit and help his father work on the farm. While trying to tame one of the new horses, he broke his leg. The villagers came by to commiserate, saying, oh, what bad luck. And just as he did the first time, the farmer replied, come on, you can join in. Bad luck, good luck, who knows? So a month later, the farmer's son was still recovering. He wasn't able to walk or do anything very active to help his father around the farm. During that time, a regiment of the army came by, conscripting every able-bodied young man to join them. When the regiment came to the farmer's house and saw the young boy's broken leg, they marched right by and left him where he was. And of course, all the villagers came by and said, 
What amazing luck you have. You are so fortunate. To which the farmer replied all together now, bad luck, good luck, who knows? Thank you. That is our story for today, and I will invite all of us to help sing everyone to their activities. Good morning, beloveds. Good morning. I am Michael Macias. I'm the intern minister here at Mount Diablo Unitarian Universalist Church, and my pronouns are they and them. Freedom. It's a curious word that has deep, significant meaning to us, both individually and collectively. On one hand, we honor and value the individual freedoms we have, and on the other, we wrestle with the deprivation of freedom of our siblings at the hands of a system and in the institutions. With the 4th of July upon us, millions across the nation will gather to celebrate their individual freedoms amid the barbecues, laughter, and deep sense of patriotism. Perhaps some or many of us will find ourselves less interested in observing the contradictory state of freedom in this country and more interested in reflecting on this feeling of incertitude. There was a period in my life when I taught eighth grade US history. We had standards that explicitly named the content we were required to teach. While I didn't deviate too much from the curriculum, except for naming the shadow truths in US history and teaching about BIPOC contributions to this country, I presented it in a way that invited students to explore the materials, be curious about its meaning, and think critically about these events or documents that we were reading about, and how they were relevant to their experience in this world. Though the English philosopher John Locke had much to say about individual liberty, synonymous with freedom, I want to highlight one element of his views captured in his second treatise of government. In it, Locke suggested that individual liberty is about the implication of responsibility and duty. Through this lens, we can see a framework that invites us to hold individual freedom and liberty as sacred while remembering our state of interdependence. I have no curriculum to cover with you this morning. You're welcome, no teaching. <laughs> but I do invite you, much like I did with the students I was teaching, to explore this holiday and how freedom, or the lack thereof, shapes our experiences and our relationships with this community and the greater world. It's not lost on me that we are attempting to celebrate the ideals of freedom and liberty on the heels of sweeping opinions from the Supreme Court of the United States that have added to the systematic dismantling of them. Surely, we are angry, perhaps anxious. And in this, perhaps we are also experiencing our Unitarian Universalist values, calling us into a deeper sense of that interdependence that calling to channel this anger and anxiety into a movement towards collective liberation, a collective liberation where all our siblings can experience the richness of the freedom and liberty that Locke spoke of while honoring our responsibility and duty to one another. It cannot be true freedom or liberty if it's not for all of us. In this movement towards collective liberation, we are advancing an idea that is more than inclusion or representation. We're creating a different paradigm altogether. It's a space 
where liberty and freedom reside, in the places where it can be experienced by our LGBTQIA siblings, our black and brown and indigenous and people of color siblings, our siblings experiencing housing insecurity, our siblings with disabilities, and so many more, so many more. It's a space where economic liberation Liberation of the earth and all of its life forms. Feminism, justice, and harm reduction all coalesce. It doesn't hold one person or group of persons as more worthy of freedom or liberty. It doesn't deprive one person or group of persons of freedom or liberty. And this won't come from the very institutions that give and take our freedoms and liberties. Indeed, independence, including those freedoms and liberties, sit at the center of our interdependence. It is an organic process rooted in relationships and our willingness to bring each other into beloved community. This is how we reclaim our liberties and our freedoms. Come. Let us worship together. We invite you to rise in body or spirit. Let's join in singing our opening song, Creation of Peace. This is new to us. So as we go through, the melody will come to you and you'll be able to join in. We'll build the love. Here we go. We'll build the love where we bind up the broken. It is the tradition in our congregation when we lose a member to death that we light a candle from our chalice. And I am lighting a candle today for Edie Hedgecock. Edie has been a member of our congregation for many years 
and was active in our elder journey in other communities, especially interested in women's matters. Edie has died after a long illness and most recently um, was living in Pleasant Hill in an assisted living facility uh, where she was during the course of the, um, the lockdown where we worked hard to keep in touch with Edie. Edie's family is planning a service and celebration of her life for September, so watch for the details. And let us take a moment and remember Edie Hedgecock. This is the time in our service when we take into the loving embrace of this congregation those joys and sorrows that are too great to hold alone. And I am asking Michael to light the first candle for Maria Hunt, who is asking for prayers for their two-year-old son, Ethan, who will be having his third MRI in six months six months this week to monitor a tumor in his brain after an inconclusive biopsy in March. We're praying that this MRI will help his team determine a treatment plan for him, Maria says. I'm also asking Michael to light a candle for Julie Yip, who is asking for continued prayers as her husband, Scott, recovers from a serious health incident. I am asking Michael to also light a candle for David, Schum David Shoemaker, who is just transferred yesterday to the Manor Care on Rossmore Parkway and who um, welcomes being remembered by his MDUUC friends. And Michael is also lighting a candle for Mary Allen, who writes, with the help of amazing technology, intense exercise, and generous people in my life, I am recovering from a total knee replacement followed by a total hip replacement. I am now a super bionic woman and I'm hopeful about getting out on the trails in a few months. I miss seeing my MDUC friends on campus. So we are thinking of you, Mary, and wishing you a speedy re continued recovery. Bob Maxwell is lighting a candle. He writes, next Friday will mark my 76th trip around the sun You, oh, he also writes, Mary Bobness. There we go. <laughs> 76, let's try it. Here we go. And Tom Taylor is lighting a candle to acknowledge his daughter, Elena's 19th birthday, The Cycle Goes On. Yes. And I invite Michael to light two final candles to hold the first to hold those joys and sorrows that are held in our hearts but not expressed in words this morning, and the second to mark our hopes and dreams, particularly today, for our country and for our world. Thank you. As we prepare for our time of meditation, we invite you to join in singing our meditation song, In My Quiet Sorrow. Let me be 
Two weeks ago, I told you from this pulpit that it was my last sermon until the fall, and it is. I'm grateful to have others today. I did not say it was my last sermon service because I knew, as many of us did, that the Supreme Court was expected to make some rulings, and I knew that if they did, I would want to be with you one more time before the summer. So I invite us to enter into the spirit of prayer and meditation and reflection. It is so important for us as community and as a community of faith that we hold together that which is too great for us to hold alone. So on this day, on this Sunday, the eve of a celebration of this nation, let us hold our grief at the loss of the ability of people to plan for the responsibilities of child rearing and the injustice of using women's bodies as political pawns. Let us hold together our horror at the expansion of gun rights at a time of an epidemic of gun violence. Let us hold together our sorrow at the restriction of the tools for the paltry interventions we have been trying to make against the reality of climate change. Let us hold all of these in our hearts and let us turn to the deep ask of prayer. Spirit of life, God of love, May we be reminded on this day that the best prayer for an ailing democracy is written on the back of postcards and letters and sent to those whom we should never forget, we elect. We ask that we not forget that the best incantation against the demons of declining democracy is the affirmation of the sanctity of the voting box which we must teach to our children and their children and their children. May we remember in this place that the best spiritual teachers for our times are those whose identities have made them long subject to spiritual disciplines of patience and fortitude. And we ask today, spirit of all that we hold holy, that we remember that the best act of faith we can display in the face of the destruction of human rights is to recommit to the long-term courageous work of rebuilding and the perseverance to stay in the struggle. In the spirit of all that we still hold dear and all of our ideals, let us make each of the tomorrows to come a meditation on independence as a right for all and a chance to remember the humanity of those who would promote democracy by limiting its use, waving the flags, taking away votes, May we, in this time, pray for the larger heart. And may we be the ones to make it so. Hi, this is Linda Russell. Very proud of how many of us were uh, there, uh, representing our um, uh, our congregation. Um, all our delegate slots were filled, uh, which I understand was not the story with uh, every congregation. So I was very proud of that. Delegate communication. We were so supportive of each other and um, staying in contact. Um, and updating each other. 
I was very proud of our young adults uh, having an opportunity to spend time with them. They truly represent UU spirituality, and I was very grateful to get to um, have some conversation. Um, also enjoyed the Berry Street Address with Reverend Michael, the Ware Street Discussion with Dr. Kendi, and several drum conversation. This is Elsie Mills. Although I've been a UU for over 30 years, General Assembly 2022 was only my fourth GA. Each one I was attending as an MDUC delegate. Our ministers, staff, leaders, and members of this congregation have inspired me to participate in the governance of our faith. This year's GA was a multi-platform event, both online and live. I attended live in Portland, my first visit to this beautiful area, included. We learned together, often in real time, how to be better at listening, how to be more inclusive of people with differing abilities, and how to center the experiences of Black, Indigenous, and people of color. My favorite experience at GA was having lunch with three of our MDC youth. They were funny, interesting, and exuberant about being UUs, talking about their faith and supporting each other. They appreciated being with our small group of adults and had lots to say. And I saw how much Indigo, Marina, and our RE and high school youth volunteer teachers made a difference in keeping our RE program strong over these past challenging years. Leslie, it's Mary Beth, and I wanted to leave you a message about General Assembly. Um, my was um, full of hearing rough things and being disappointed in myself and in what was going on, and then having to make adaptations on the fly and changing what was going on and learning that it it was okay. Um, I got COVID right before I was supposed to leave, and I had to stay home. And things didn't work, and that was a thing, too. And so we had disappointed people and we had to make new accommodations for people and the and the things like the captioning didn't work and that we had to make new discussions about and things failed. Hi Leslie, this is Nisa Matt. Um I was calling with my uh, favorite part of GA this year in Portland, Oregon. Um, I, for the first time, was a sponsor for the youth this year. And I really enjoyed watching how much they grew in the one week that we were together. Um, it was very inspiring to me to see the way that they became comfortable in using their voices to speak up for what they needed and uh, interact with each other in a way that was covenantal and, and respectful, but also interacting with our, our larger faith as a whole. Hey, this is Ron Onan. Two things that I liked about GA. Number one is this idea of looking at Article 2 and re-examining and rethinking about how it is that we want to express who we are as you use and who we are as, a, as, an, as an association. I think that's a healthy thing to do uh, every once in a while. And this is the, uh, this time has come and I'm very excited about moving forward with that project. It's a little scary because we have to let go of some of the language that we're very used to. Uh, but at the same time, it's a chance for us to perhaps broaden and deepen uh, what we're about or expressing how we're about that. And, and I, it's an exciting thing. The other thing that I liked about this GA um, was the uh, amount, the, the number of theological reflections and the uh, opportunities that we had to really dig into uh, how our beliefs and our theology fit into what we're about. That's something that I didn't see at previous GAs and I think is going to probably be something uh, going forward as well. So that was exciting. 
Uh, this is Jim Lincoln. My experience at GA was just energizing and uh, inspiring throughout. Uh, the addresses, maybe especially by Bill Sinkford and Susan Frederick Gray, were terrific. And, of course, the youth bridging service was wonderful. So the, the whole thing was a true delight. Freedom 
Don't we love our house band? <laughs> Thank you. Good morning, my name is Mark David Watanabe. My pronouns are he and him, and I'm a member of your board of trustees. I also had the privilege, if you've noticed in the photos, of joining our delegation to the recent UUA General Assembly in Portland, Oregon. And while there were some first timers among us, I'll sheepishly admit that this was my 23rd GA. <laughs> now, to those of you who have heard me up here before, you know how much I like to count things. <laughs> this is a seminal moment for our faith tradition as we collectively discern how we want to live out our values in the world. At this annual gathering, somewhat disparate visions regarding our future were evident. Yet, despite our differences, it has always impressed me that at every GA I've attended, there has consistently been a display of spontaneous and heartfelt generosity. In Portland, there were four special asks for the funding of the Side with Love, You, You, The Vote campaign, the Living Tradition Fund for Religious Professionals in Need, the Katie Tyson Fund for Youth and Young Adult Ministries, and a local partner, East County Rising Community Projects. In just over a few days, over $125,000 had been collected. It was an inspiring validation of how, when we come together in support of good works, amazing possibilities can be realized. Let us carry that powerful GA spirit of generosity in this moment, whether in a basket on campus or through the Give Now button on our website. This is your opportunity to show solidarity with your peers at GA as we strive to create a Unitarian Universalism that more aptly serves the needs of spiritual seekers in the 21st century. I invite the ushers now to come forward. Your offerings will now be gratefully received.
please join with me in reciting our dedication of the offering. To the work of this community in transforming ourselves and our world, we dedicate ourselves and our offerings. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Evan Yunker. For those of you who don't know me, it has been a while. Um, and for those of you who don't know me, I moved to Georgia about four or five years ago, and uh, it is really good to be back. And I want to thank Reverend Leslie for the opportunity to share a message with you uh, this morning. And I want to thank you all for having me. Um, uh, as some of you may know, I'm leaving the country at the end of the month. And uh, this has always been my spiritual home, at least for the last 12, 12-ish, 12, 12 or 13, somewhere in there years. Um, and it's really an honor to be with you, probably doing my last sermon <laughs> before I leave. So thank you for having me. Some 200 some odd years ago, a group of 56 men, 41 of them slave owners, sat down in Independence Hall and signed a document that said in part, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It goes on to list 27 grievances and then declares, these united colonies are, and of right, ought to be free and independent states. And that is the impetus behind our celebration of the American Independence Day. It is worth noting that while this document was being signed on the first floor, fugitive slave violations were being processed on the second floor that day. That duality of the American concept of independence has been around in our country since its inception. For people of color, women, native peoples, the LGBTQIA plus community, and others, Independence Day is filled with hypocrisies and complications. Certainly, when the Founding Fathers visualized the celebrations of that day, they did not fathom their slaves or their descendants joining in. Frederick Douglass pointed this out memorably in 1852. What, to the American slave, is your 4th of July? I answer, a day that reveals to him more than all other days the gross injustice and cruelty to which he is constant victim. To him, your celebration is a sham, your boasted liberty an unholy license, your national greatness swelling vanity. Your sounds of rejoicing are empty and heartless, your denunciation of tyrants brass-fronted impudence. Your shouts of liberty and equality, hollow mockery, your prayers and hymns, your sermons and thanksgivings with all your religious parade and solemnity are to him mere bombast, fraud, deception, impiety, and hypocrisy. A thin veil to cover up crimes which would disgrace a nation of savages. There is not a nation on the earth guilty of the practices more shocking and bloody than are the people of the United States at this very hour. He certainly did not mince words. <laughs> but here's the thing. Frederick Douglass also realized the difference between the practices of this country and its ideals. A little over 12 years later, he said bluntly, abolish slavery tomorrow and not a sentence or syllable in your constitution need be altered. The ideals were there. The chasm between our ideals as a nation and our practices has been with us since this time. Sometimes we celebrate when we live into our highest collective self, and sometimes we mourn as our dominant culture tramples the rights of others. For many Americans, nothing is wrong or ever has been wrong. 
America is and has always been great. For others, it constantly fails to live up to its potential. If for a moment we gloss over these complications and hypocrisies, we can come to understand this dominant Euro-American perspective on this holiday. Personally, I am no stranger to it. As a white, cisgendered, heterosexual man growing up in Virginia, I had that Euro-dominant Euro view of Independence Day, a view I maintained, quite frankly, until I was in my mid-20s. I believed America stood alone as the greatest nation in the world. I believed that if people did nothing wrong, they wouldn't get in trouble, and those in prison were there because they deserved it. That everyone had equality under the law, the union was perfect, and democracy was infallible. The will of the people be done, and that is what is most important. Go America, love it or leave it, rah, rah. I had the whole thing. What a grand exercise and privilege my youth provided me. Of course, between, because my right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness was never in question, I simply assumed that since it was in writing, all people had the same privileges and experiences as me. Even today, I'm not immune to regressive patterns of behavior and thought. Just a couple of week, weeks ago, I had a fairly contentious discussion with someone I care very deeply about. In it, I approached a few topics from what I called pragmatic, and he called oppressive perspective. I ended up on the phone with a friend and mentor back east seeking advice and input. I was reminded of my place in the world and how it differs from the person with whom I had been speaking. I was reminded of the time recently where I took a trip cross country, about the third time I've done that in four years. And I was reminded of the fact that almost all of my interaction with governments, institutions, and society in general have been positive in my life. My friend told me bluntly that as an African-American man, he could never fathom driving cross country both ways with his family. And he suggested I put myself in the shoes of the person who wakes up every day with a different view of the world, one in which they feel threatened by people in power and viewed suspiciously by everyone else. One where the odds are stacked against them and systems created to privilege some actively oppress others. It was a powerful reality check. So much of America lives in a world where they are not followed around by security guards in stores. They are not pulled over without cause. When they are pulled over, they don't have to fear for their lives. We see the desire to elevate America as a country that wants to and believes that all people have rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness and that these rights cannot be taken from them. We can see the whitewashed values that many proclaim to espouse in spite of their actions and choices in elected officials, a view rooted in their individual experiences that are devoid of complex attitudes toward them, as well as empathy from them toward others. And when we take off our whitewashed glasses, we see in reality how often we fall short of those ideals. Whether the slave trade of the era the Declaration was signed, or the removal of rights to bodily autonomy and the overturning of Roe v. Wade by the Supreme Court, mass incarceration, environmental injustice, food insecurity, the struggle for voting rights, we have fallen short of our ideals. The struggles have been there in the past, and they remain today. Yet at its core, the desire to seek and declare independence and rights for individuals and the collective is a good thing, one that we continue to work to realize. For the Fugitive Slave Act was repealed. The Supreme Court cleared a path to remove the Remain in Mexico policy. And laws and policies requiring women to have a husband or father sign financial documents for them have been pushed by the wayside. We have seen those things undone some a while ago and some just last week. Just as the duality of this country existed in its founding, a duality exists today. It's okay to recognize that great strides have been made since our founding, while at the same time acknowledging that great progress remains to be made moving forward. As the abolitionist minister Theodore Parker said, 
I do not pretend to understand the moral universe. The arc is a long one. My eye reaches but little ways. I cannot calculate the curve and complete the figure by experience of sight. I can divine it by conscience. And from what I see, I am sure it bends toward justice. Now this bending is not simply achieved. It is won by work, by organizing, by strengthening the communities in which we are part. Suffragist Jane Addams says it best, in the unceasing ebb and flow of justice and oppression, we must dig channels as best we may, that at the propitious moment, some swelling of the tide may occur. It may be conducted to the barren places of life. As you use, we are not promised a perfect world, and we do not have, as a collective, uh, a belief in the afterlife, a heaven, if you will. Rather, we are charged with creating heaven on earth, a society based on shared and common values in our lifetimes. We must bring to Independence Day a visible testimony to those values. Allow it to spark in us a commitment, a recommitment to bring those values to life for those it has all too often removed from the collective liberation of our nation. And let us be cautious in compromise, standing firm where we must, knowing how history has taught us the use of compromise to enshrine oppression in the status quo. Margaret Thatcher once said, consensus is the process of abandoning all beliefs, principles, values, and policies in search of something in which no one believes but to which no one objects. What great cause would have been fought and won under the banner, I stand for consensus? Rather, we should stand firm in our convictions that every person is endowed with inherent worth and dignity, that we should respect the interdependent web of all existence, and that justice, equity, and compassion should be at the forefront of human relations. And we should do so with the goal of creating world community with peace, liberty, and justice for all. Let our expression of patriotism be not based on empty words in American flag clothing, but in challenging the America to live up to its dream. Together, let us seek independence in striving for interdependence. Let us find our strength in the creation of beloved community. Let us bend that arc of the moral universe toward justice, and let us establish rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness for all. We acknowledge defeats while celebrating progress. As we plant our flag on the side of justice, we build on the successes of the past in righting the wrongs of today. In all our struggles and setbacks, we retain the power of hope, the power of community, the power of faith. Perhaps former President Obama put it best in saying, what greater expression of faith in the American experiment than this? What greater form of patriotism is there than the belief that America is not yet finished that we are strong enough to be self-critical, that each successive generation can look upon our imperfections and decide that it is in our power to remake this nation more closely aligned with our highest ideals. May it be so. We invite you to rise in body or spirit, join in singing our closing song. This is my song, Finlandia. Words will be on your screen.
And we will now, as we close this service and this week in which we celebrate the founding of this country in this time in which we mourn the realities of our democracy in this week when just past our association reaffirmed its commitments to its democratic principles through its General Assembly of Congregations. We will extinguish this chalice. And as we do, may its sparks remind us of our recommitment to the ideals of our nation and our faith. For it is, as our president, Susan Frederick Gray says, no time for a casual faith. May we go in peace and in the spirit of love. <laughs>